Satan wants to take your soul. I think that's something we should talk about. Let's get into it. At the age of 92, Jack Chick is dead. You might ask, who is Jack Chick? And that's a fair question, because you've probably never heard of him before, but you probably have seen his work. These little black books called Chick Tracks were prolific. These little booklets were meant to contain truth about the good news of Jesus Christ and how he wanted to burn most of you in hell. Pretty much all of you. I mean, there's only really very few he wouldn't want to burn in hell. In fact, the only way you can guarantee not to be burned in hell is probably if you agree with Jack Chick. These things were meant to talk about the evils of the modern world, the way that sin crept its way into everyday society, how it crept its way into your heart, and how that sin slowly eroded the fabric of your soul until Satan himself dragged you to the fiery pits of hell to burn for all eternity. Thank God for Jack Chick, because that man is the only man that cared enough to tell you the truth that God sent AIDS to kill homosexuals, the truth that rock music will corrupt your children, the truth that Halloween is about human sacrifice. Jack Chick, chick him out. Chicka chicka. Now these little things cover all sorts of topics, from the very dangerous, soul-destroying work of, well, uh, rock music, Halloween, homosexuality, Islam, Catholicism, and even D&D. &D. Yes, that horrific gateway game to sin and corruption, Dungeons and Dragons, was created and marketed by satanic cults itself to drag your sorry, pitiful soul into the fiery pits of damnation. Chick tracks were but one of the amazing uh, devices of misinformation that led to D&D &D being branded as both satanic, psychologically damaging, and suicide inducing during the mid to late 80s. There was this huge rush of misinformation of people talking about the dangers of this new game that people were getting involved in. Large numbers of students were playing this game now and people were genuinely concerned that this would not only corrupt their soul but lead to them killing themselves in bizarre rituals or feeling cursed or if their character died wanting to go with their character because they had nothing else to live for. Now it's easy for us to look back and to judge the people back then and see just how unscientific and how crazy it is but at the time there was quite a furor. Part of it was fueled by genuine real events that were happening in people's communities. It led to sales slumping, it led to uh, lots of court cases. Eventually they weathered through it and they probably would have done as well if the business itself wasn't being poorly managed. But the fact is, is that there was this period in the 80s where people genuinely thought that D&D &D could lead to teen suicide. People thought that it was the main contributor to teen suicide until we got genuine data on the topic. Some of the factors that led to this were included people like Patricia Pulling, the head of an organization called Bothered About D&D &D, or BAD for short, which I believe actually inspired the Futurama episode where there was Fathers Against Rude Television, Fart. And I think that's in part because pretty much every writer on Futurama became a writer through playing D&D. &D. Patricia Pulling went through the horrible event of having her son commit suicide. And after her son committed suicide, suddenly discovered that he had been playing Dungeons and Dragons for years. Now, being a fundamentalist Christian, she saw the the, the monsters and the, the witchcraft and the wizardry and all that going on it, and immediately believed that her son was cursed, allegedly found this written curse in her son's possession that was given to her character, and so, of course, naturally assumed that her son committed suicide because his character in D&D had been cursed. It's a perfectly reasonable scientific explanation. Part of what brought Pulling to the fore was a 60 Minutes report which was investigating the nature of D&D in light of certain events that had occurred such as the disappearance of James Dallas Egbert III. At the stage of the report they hadn't actually found the boy and they believed he was missing as a result of playing Dungeons and Dragons. He was living at the university that he was studying at and went missing in some of the tunnels that go into the weave underneath the university there. People said that he went down there to act out his role-playing character, or apparently, allegedly, they 
role played and acted things out as they went, which just goes to show how long LARPing has been around for. But it turns out that he had tried to commit suicide, but he failed at it and then he went and hid at a neighbor's place. But this took over a month to come out. In the meantime, because of the connections with D&D, the investigative reporter that was hired to try and find him made these links, reported them to police. The police investigated Gary Gygax, the creator of D&D and the TSR uh, organization at the time. There was a whole bunch of news media reports about the whole thing. Pulling came to the fore and she was talking about her son's suicide. At this time, there also came the Schrodenberg, Schro hold on, Schnobelin, Schnobelin, Schnoo, Schnobelin, Schnobelin articles, look at that, Schnobelin articles, William Schnobelin claimed to be part of the occult, he uh, said that he was a Wiccan priest and that he was a part of satanic practices, his goal was to try and motivate people away from that practice themselves, one of the things that he said was part of the new age movement towards these things or a gateway into satanic or cult like practices was Dungeons and Dragons, claiming that the spells were absolutely real and that the practices and the occult practices were 100% authentic. He acted as a bit of a consultant on this and took a lot of letters from people and uh, worked within his church movement as part of this uh, savior of people from the satanic world. This also brought about an interest in the media with books and movies being made about these actual events but sort of with details changed, but everyone knew what they were talking about. And so there was this whole movement against D&D &D and people really thought that this thing was starting to become evil and leading people and children into uh, the world of Satanism. And I guess we look back at those sorts of things and we think how crazy it is. And yet at the same time, not that long ago, I remember many of the same things happening with a small book series called Harry Potter. And we're not even talking 20 years here yet. We're talking about the early 2000s. There were church groups and organizations dedicated to eradicating these, this book series from book lists everywhere. And we think about this in the modern world and we go, well, this is ridiculous, but there's a, still a strong movement within these evangelical groups to look at the world through this lens of God versus Satan and demons everywhere and everyone's fighting over your soul. So things like Harry Potter become this big playground almost for uh, children to be indoctrinated into the evils of the world. However, as we've gotten older, we've also started to intellectualize this a bit. And for people who think that this sounds crazy, well, think about the fact that Dungeons and Dragons and Harry Potter were both by many considered to be psychologically damaging. As we've grown in the sciences and started to let go of a lot of the mythos and the fear and trepidation around demonic presences, people have started to utilize the idea of psychology and more social issues as being the agenda that these things are corroding. So D&D isn't just bringing people into Satanism, it's psychologically damaging. Harry Potter is psychologically damaging. Schools were taking Harry Potter off of their book lists and both Christian schools and schools that were concerned about the psychological impact. But the thing is though, is surely we're past this now. Surely we're over all of this issue. Surely we don't fall for this sort of thing anymore. Then along comes Pokemon Go and I'm reminded of just how volatile our communities still are. That communities can have this visceral, emotional outrage or fear and trepidation of new, these new products. And the fact that kids pick them up so quickly, we seem to be suspicious of everything that kids do to the point where if large amounts of children want to get into something, then there must be something inherently evil about it. And I wonder what the driving force behind that sort of thinking is. And of course the science came out on D&D, &D, and of course the science came out on Harry Potter, and children weren't committing suicide because of these things. And yet still today, even though we have moved beyond the fear of the occult and Satanism, and even some sense become more aware psychologically, there is still a fear campaign against anything new and popular. And people claim things like Pokemon Go is emotionally damaging, that it's uh, still socially damaging, that children could injure themselves and harm themselves, and it's still people just acting out of fear. And maybe that's a good indication for us that when we do start to see big public uh, reactions to things that we should step back and go, well, what's fueling this? Is it is it fear? Is it anger? Is it guilt? Is it something else? And then ask ourselves if those responses are really coming from a place that we identify with. And if it seems that science is always having to follow up these responses, I gotta say that 
Perhaps that's in part because science takes time. It took time for science to evaluate and gather data on Dungeons and Dragons. It took time for science to gather and data and to assess that data for Harry Potter. It's gonna take time for us to gather data and assess the data on Pokemon Go. In some senses, childhood will always be an experiment over what works, what doesn't work, whether something's safe or not safe, whether something's good for children or not good for children. How do we deal with these mass hysterias that come out over new and exciting product? I don't know, but I'd love to hear your thoughts on the matter. All I know is that Jack Chick, maybe he was dedicated to a greater cause. Maybe you have some opinions on this. I'm not one of these people who want to speak ill of the dead and say that I'm grateful that someone's passed away. I'm pretty keen to just let things happen naturally. And maybe with time, his style of thinking will pass into oblivion. I hope that we can build a world where we can be hopeful about our childhood and hopeful about all the new and exciting things that face us. That's all I really want to say about that. And moving on, I hope that you have gone and checked out our video on Antoine Bowser. We did a designer spotlight for the core mechanic. Antoine appears twice on Mike Selinker's list and so I thought it was worth taking some time to really investigate the sort of designer he is and some of the things he said. I really hope you'll go and take a look at our designer spotlight on Antoine Bowser. Now, look, I could have done a Halloween special this week instead of focusing on Jack Chick, but the reality is, is that I've done a few Halloween specials. I did a Halloween special for the Dice Tower. I've done a Halloween special for Insta Gamers Network, and I've done a Halloween article for Gamer Palooza. If you want to check out any of those, I'd love for you to go and have a look at them. Go check out my article at www gamerpalooza.com.au there will be other reviews and other interesting articles up there to read we've got a great cast of writers there i hope you'll check that out insta gamers network is a network i've just recently joined i'm really grateful to be there i'm with a whole bunch of really cool people that i know on instagram as well as great reviewers so i'm really excited to be a part of that network and they're doing a special on horror games so go and have a look at their network i'll put the link in the description in the description below the blender this week will have a halloween theme and so it'll be worth going and checking out the dice tower this week as well and that this week we will be releasing a few segments at the end on thursday uh, and we are working towards the end of the core mechanics so we've got i think maybe two episodes technically but it's going to be in three parts because the last one is a two-part episode that I've put together. So I hope you'll look forward to that. That's going to be a, real, a special looking at uh, video and board game design. It's based on a talk I did at uh, Oz Comic Con in Brisbane. Uh, I did it, I redid it because I wanted the sound and audio to just be better than what it was there instead of uploading what I had from the actual con. And also I wanted to do a little bit of an update on it to reflect a bit better some of my thoughts and ideas on video games because I thought it sounded a bit harsh in the actual presentation and I wanted to soften that up because I really love video games as well. Thanks for watching. If you like what we're doing here, please hit that like button. If you're new to this channel, please hit that subscribe button. And until next time, my name's Dave Adams and this is what's happening now. The problem seems to be that some kids take it more seriously than others, take it a step further playing a character who brings them the power in a game they couldn't possibly get in real life. The Dungeon Master orchestrates and referees the game, creating scenarios both complicated and terrifying. There are those who are fearful that the game in the hands of vulnerable kids could do harm. And there is evidence that seems to support that view. And start doing some serious research and start stopping children from dying over something that they didn't have to die.